Welcome to Data Publication 2, part of the Data Topics series of workshops. I am Ryan Womack. I am Data Librarian at Rutgers University Libraries. I am based in the Alexander Library on the New Brunswick campus. And this, pub, this is the first uh, to be created of the Data Topics series, um, although it's Data Publication 2. Uh, these new workshops will gradually supplant the older series of workshops and this was one that fit into that scheme. Um, so once a semester we will be having new workshops coming. Um, so here we go into Data Publication 2. So Data Publication 2 is a guide to publishing your data, sharing your data to data repositories, and also sharing your data via R packages. So it's really in two parts. And this video is about the first part, uh, publishing to data repositories. The hands-on creating R packages will be the subsequent videos in this playlist, topic list, Okay, so all of the links for this series will be in the description below. Um, I'm at the LibGuides page for data topics, which will be the place where all this material is collected. Um, and in this case, I have um, put out, there is a GitHub repository, right? So the material, um, that's available you can click on the github link you can go to you'll see data topics and you can click on the folder for data publication and you will get access to these materials um, however i've also as i will for the other others in this series created a presentation website that you can use that is a little bit more compact um, summary of the information. So let's let's jump in and get started. Um, why data publication? Why do we care? Um, well, I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but sharing data is a way to maximize the impact and usefulness of your research and is increasingly mandated by research funders. Um, if you need more convincing, uh, the reproducible research workshop uh, addresses some of those topics in more detail. So general principles, uh, data should be shared in a manner that is FAIR. Um, FAIR is an acronym that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And vagaries of the internet, uh, this major site for the FAIR organization um, seems to be down at the moment. Um, so can't quite show you that one. I pulled up just the Wikipedia article for FAIR data. Um, there is a, it's not just those four words, but under each word there are principles uh, that guide the implementation. What does it mean to be findable in, a, in today's context? So a unique and persistent identifier for data and metadata um, clear descriptions, registries, uh, things like that. Um, and they, the documents about this really talk about sort of different levels of compliance with these principles, right? There's sort of basic compliance. Um, is the data available at all? Is it accessible? Um, is it authentic, 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 can it be authenticated? Um, can users find out information about the data even when the data is 
gone. For example, some data might be deleted for privacy reasons. So FAIR is actually a very systematic um, approach to these issues, and you should really take a look at the detailed principles so that you can think more carefully about how to make your data available. Uh, a slightly newer FAIR is, is you know, universally acceptable uh, as a guiding principle these days. A newer set of principles uh, that is gaining ground and is worthy of careful consideration are the care principles for indigenous data governance. So, um, you know, the FAIR principles take a sort of technocratic uh, approach, you could say, um, that obscures some of the issues that um, are particularly important to indigenous communities, but I think, you know, actually Im important to um, all communities, in, in fact. Um, and CARE stands for collective benefit that the data that's made available should be responsive to the community's needs, right? That, that we're making the data available for the purpose of collective benefit, authority to control that the um, communities that the data is collected on um, have the authority to determine how that data is used, right? This is something that didn't often happen in the past where, you know, subject populations were studied um, and their data, um, including, you know, things like human skeletons uh, were kept without the authority of the community uh, to do anything about. Uh, responsibility um, that, you know, the whole data project um, is guided by responsibility and also ethical principles. So um, you can go from the site to get more information about that, articles, discussions, um, just like FAIR, the care principles have sub-categories to help you think more carefully about um, how the, the data is being governed, and these are definitely worthy of, of attention. So uh, FAIR, Be Fair and Care is a very good way to remember uh, to use both sets of principles to guide your data data work. All right. So those are the, the general principles that I would highlight. Um, and let's talk about actually sharing your data. Um, the NIH is the most recent U.S. funding agency uh, to come out with guidelines that are um, take into account the, the decade or more of development via the initial efforts of the National Science Foundation um, and all of the data management work that's been going on. Um, and the NIH is the, um, you know, issues a massive amount of funding and their, princip their uh, data sharing guidelines are very comprehensive. So uh, at the time of, of recording this video, this is sort of the latest and greatest wave of data sharing um, to come upon us. Uh, so the NIH has its own, you know, fairly specific guidance. Um, certainly if you're in the NIH world, you want to look at this. Um, if you're in the NSF world, you want to look at their guidance. Um, but if you're not under the guidance of a particular grant, you still want to consider these, these principles. So um, you know, the NIH talks about how to write a plan, right? We want to document and think about the point of writing a plan is to think about all these issues in advance so that we know what to do with our data as it's being generated and at the conclusion of a project to find an appropriate place to share it. So depending on the topic that you're working with, you know, NIH has its own uh, 
specific repositories, you know, a specific repository for a particular type of data, like genomics data, um, genotype tissue expression, right? It's like, you know, the data is very specialized, so it makes sense to have a specialized repository to support that. So you may find uh, that the repository that you want to think about uh, sort of naturally occurs. Other people doing this research are depositing their data in a specific um, place, the, you know, traumatic brain injury research um, that's, you know, being conducted uh, has its own system for collecting that data. Um, and it's basically going to depend on your field. We'll look at another uh, place where you can search for repositories a bit a bit later. Um, but for now, that's all I'll say about NIH. Uh, you know, their, their site is very detailed. Uh, but what NIH also lists is a set of generalist repositories. And I would say this is a pretty good list. Um, to which I will add one source that is ICPSR to that, uh, which is more social science focused. But if you don't have a repository for your data, you're going to want to consider where can you put it. Um, and these are the leading, the most widely available um, generalist repositories uh, that will essentially, in most cases, simply allow you to set up an account and to create a little space where you can upload your materials, upload the data, upload the descriptive materials, and have a place that's internet accessible where people can find and discover your data. So um, on my web page, I have italicized the ones that are, you know, particularly um, if you're not even sure among this list which ones you might want to use, um, the italicized ones are very wide ranging, very easy to use, uh, so you might want to start with those. So I'm going to do a kind of quick um, tour through my tabs so we can see some of those. Uh, Dataverse is both uh, software to that manages repositories which can be downloaded and installed uh, so there are actually 106 uses of the software at the time of um, of viewing this but the largest uh, place to use the Dataverse is the Harvard Dataverse repository um, so I just clicked on set up a personal Dataverse collection. The Harvard deposit repository is open. Oh, and that one is a bit odd. OK, let's go to this one. Um, Dataverse.harvard.edu. Harvard uh, makes their resource freely available at this point, um, funded by you know, Harvard money. And you can simply create an account and it, it's actually a, a very good place to sort of manage uh, an individual um, collection right so you can you can have a collection that is either tied to a specific article such as this replication material um, I'm just going to randomly click on this one. So this Sebastian Jungkunz Dataverse is Sebastian Jungkunz's essentially personal account, right, that he has, I'm assuming that's a he, I maybe shouldn't make an assumption, but um, this, these are five separate data collections that Sebastian Jungkunz has uploaded. Um, you know, they get a nice page to host this and when you go into each one you will find um, data files metadata 
uh, and this is all user contrib contributed, right? So you you want to consider if you're going to use this, you want to make the data easily findable, easily discoverable. Include not only your data, but include code books or data documentation files, uh, README files, however you want to describe your data. Uh, use the system that they have for keywords to um, put in keywords that will enable others to find your data. And of course, what all of these major repositories will do that um, is often, you know, something that you're looking for uh, that drives the data deposit in the first place is to have a DOI assigned. So the DOI is a digital object identifier, a permanent identifier to the, the data source. And if we search for a DOI on the internet or go to, well, that may not be the best way to do that. What I would recommend that's a little more careful way to do that is to go to doi.org and the DOI organization uh, has a tool to resolve DOI identifiers. We can paste it into the box and it will direct us back to the Harvard Dataverse, right? So that's a universal permanently available way to make the data findable. And the fact that the data is downloadable here, it makes it accessible. Um, and, you know, we're fulfilling that fair and care steps by doing this. Okay. Uh, I've talked a little bit more about the setup of these, uh, but essentially all of the other um, data repositories that we look at will have a similar mechanism. Uh, create an account and follow their instructions to start uploading. Um, so this was the dataverse of an individual. You could also do an organization. Um, Dryad uh, is, is a repository that is, uh, some journals are, are well tied in to, to Dryad that um, you will be asked to deposit your data in Dryad. Um, Dryad is maybe not the place to start if you don't already have an affiliation um, to um, to use Dryad, I would say. So I'm not going to go further into that, but Dryad, you know, all each of these is very popular and has many, has lots of data in it. So actually all of them are, are high quality, legitimate repositories. Uh, Figshare is um, another place where you can go to upload, uh, but it does sort of privilege those who have accounts and um, connections to, to Figshare. Um, kind of similar to Dryad, I would say that, you know, if you if you have a tie in to Figshare, um, it's great to use. If you do not have any tie in, you might want to consider the um, italicized ones on my list, which are um, going to be truly open uh, to you. Okay. Uh, continuing our tour, there's IEEE Dataport. Now this is tied to IEEE, which is in uh, engineering. And so you're going to see a bit of a slant to, you know, engineering useful databases, um, data sets. Uh, but if you have a an IEEE tie-in, again, this is an excellent um, data repository. Uh, Mendeley, I guess out of all these, so Mendeley is tied into Read Elsevier. Um, it's it's a little bit more of a commercially tied um, data repository. It is free to use and, and, you know, drop your data in there. I, and it may be just me anecdotally, but, you know, I have um, noticed that 
things deposited here are slightly less. I, I've seen things that are deposited here that are not carefully described. Let me put it that way. Um, that, um, you know, it's anyone can use it and I feel like it doesn't have quite the same um, maybe it's just the, the audience that that's using it but not quite the same kind of quality control um, that others um, use so but it is an, an option and you know if you like the way that things work here you you may have a good reason to use Mendeley as well Okay, open ICPSR. Of the ones on the list, this one is also, to an outside audience, not quite open, but Rutgers is a member of ICPSR. So as a Rutgers person, Rutgers-affiliated person, you can share data via open ICPSR without paying any fee or charge. ICPSR is very much um, social science-based, uh, so actually I'm going to follow their prompt and search for race and ethnicity. The, there are two parts of the ICPSR database. There is open ICPSR and there's ICPSR. ICPSR data is official curated data often from major government sources um, or research studies that have been flagged for special attention. So the, ICPSR data gets uh, reviewed by the ICPSR staff and you know all the metadata is kind of worked out there is a quality control step that open ICPSR leaves to the individual depositor right so that um, but open ICPSR is used as a a replication archive for for many journals uh, as you see these replication data and it's also a place where anyone who's a member as we are at Rutgers can go in and deposit data now so if you're if you think that your data has a similar audience to the kind of people who would be searching ICPSR anyway, like social science researchers, depositing your data in open ICPSR means that when people search ICPSR, they will see your data. So um, like the other repositories, it's up to you to provide your, your data, your documentation, um, your readme, your codebook, and provide your keywords so you'd want to, again, take a careful look at how ICPSR typically does things and align your use of descriptive uh, information with that so it works well with the rest of the database. Um, but uh, once again, this would be a great place to deposit data for a social science project. So. And that, this is the one source that's not on the NIH list because it's not really health, uh, scientific health. Actually, it is. there's a lot of health data that is about the social impacts of health in ICPSR. Okay, so that's Open ICPSR. Um, Open Science Foundation, I guess I would say this one is um, particularly useful for uh, larger projects. I'm just going to continue with that example and see what we can find on race and ethnicity. One of their signature projects that they started with was um, trying to replicate psychology experiments uh, and they um, had 30 or 40 psychology journal articles that they tried to reproduce uh, the results using using data um, those kind of projects uh, at the project level um, work really well in OSF um, so if we take a look at one of these 
you can see the project, you know, goes by a project title. Um, it's prompting me to, to create an account and do this for myself. Um, the project can have files organized in multiple categories. Um, and, you know, it has recommended citations. Um, the fact that you can sort of easily structure folders underneath um, and also these kind of linkages um, that link you back to articles and other references uh, make this one you know it's it's a very good system if you if you are interested in making use of all of those uh, connecting features to situate your work in the scholarly ecosystem. Um, they also provide, you know, really kind of useful uh, metrics. I think I'm clicking on a relatively new project here, so we're not seeing a lot of visits. Um, if I were to go back and search for psychology, I, I'll probably see some of their major psychology projects um, psychology because of the way they started uh, is is one of the areas that is well represented here um, and just want to see one of their older projects I think I'm not I'm, I'm not going to find the the big study that I, I'm looking for but you can see that this is this is a um, a site that has been around for a relatively long time in repository terms uh, I believe has evolved to become a major part of the landscape um, has a number of useful search and linkage features um, particularly if you were to um, have a larger project. I'm clicking on Brian Nosek because this is one of the people involved in the creation of OSS. So I, you can see that this person is involved with 331 projects via OSF. Um, and this this kind of profile also shows you the the linkages that are generated here are a little bit more rich and complex right so we can see all of the data that a person has created um, presentations grant proposals it, it allows you to like tie in all those materials so if this approach appeals to you again i would say um, strongly consider osf osf used to stand for open science foundation it's one of these ones that they're trying to move towards um, acronyms right <laughs> um, but that's OSF uh, so others on the NIH list are ones that are more um, I think health focused um, I'm coming from more of a social science space myself so these are ones that I don't deal with on a regular basis as much but um, NIH recommends synapse uh, and this is another one where you can create an account and register your data. Uh, and they, like ICPSR does uh, for its content, has portals that address specific topics. Uh, this one, as you can see, is very much health and medicine focused. So that's Synapse. Uh, then we have Vivli uh, for clinical research data. So again, a very specific focus here, but uh, if that is your um, data that you're generating, you know, this is a place where you can describe, register, and make available information about clinical trials, um, you know, which is its own important segment of data sharing. Uh, I won't go further into that one. And uh, finally, among the sort of recommended uh, generalist repositories, 
Uh, Zenodo is one that is perhaps not quite as feature rich as OSF, but super easy to use. You know, you can just create an account, pop something up, um, and I know, for example, that at a recent conference, um, I attend, I'm a member of iAssist, and iAssist uses Zenodo as a way to share um, its uh, conference presentation materials. So if there's a number of things um, going back that, that I have done that have ended up at uh, Zenodo because that's the archive for ISIS. So um, let me pick this one. This one's a little. So one thing about Zenodo is that it's it's sort of lightweight in a sense that it can accept all kinds of materials very very quickly. Um, once you upload it, it has even though it's lightweight, it has a really nice framework that lets you. You know, link to communities, right? For example, this is an ISIST 22 conference presentation. Gives you the DOI, uh, gives you citation, um, recommended citations in different styles, um, and unlimited use, really. I think there's a size limit on the, the types of data that you can... W one thing that we haven't addressed is this if you really do have large, large scale data, you know, going beyond um, a couple of gigabytes up into larger realms, um, those are things that the, these generalist repositories may have some limits on. Those limits are always changing and dependent on the repository. So I don't want to go down a road of discussing exactly how much goes where, um, but it is, uh, it is an, an issue to be aware of that these are general purpose. They're they're open. They're usable for wide range of of uses, but not quite the largest uh, data sets uh, typically. Okay, um, so that concludes our tour of the repositories that are recommended by NIH. Uh, plus my additional recommendation of OpenICPSR. Um, there's also a comparison table uh, that's linked from, from there that does talk about what each one um, currently um, has available, right? So you can actually see this has do, does have some information about size limits um, and either on individual files or total storage per data set. Um, so that, that you could use to make some d determination. Um, we have some homegrown uh, repositories uh, that Protein Data Bank, which is, uh, has originated at Rutgers and also collaboration with UC San Diego um, is an example of a specialized uh, data bank for just for protein structures in this case. Um, if you want to discover more things like this, the index that I would recommend. So if, if n nothing that I have talked about so far um, registers with you as a place you could use, Re3 data is a is a searchable um, network a description of, of repositories. So if I search for um, well, let me search for something a little different, like animal data. Um, we've been looking at health and social sciences and things like that. Um, so there are you know thousands of, of repositories that are described in this some people pronounce that res data taking the three as an s or some people say read three data um, you can discover uh, 
repositories in all kinds of different research fields. So you can see from the keywords here that um, there is some very detailed stuff, right? So if we want to find other um, repositories on, let's say, animal genetics, cell and devel developmental biology, we can just simply click on a um, tag and pull those up. So there's 109 that have been identified in this database for animal genetics, cell and devel developmental biology, and we get to actually see the subject um, tree, right? It, it, it enables us to browse for other related topics. We can use all of these filters Right, let's say we want to make sure we we find an open repository, right? Because this site lists open and closed repositories. We can check off that. Or if we needed to restrict the data, we can find repositories that can restrict data using these filters. Um, and you know, there's a lot here, right? There's license types, availability of certain software, um, you know, can it support a database? all these types of things um, that might influence your choice. And if we, I'm going to click on Beetle Base because that has an interesting title. Um, when we click on a particular repository, uh, what it does is gives us descriptive information. Now, this one is warning us actually that this database doesn't exist anymore. Um, so this project expired. Maybe I should go back and look at something else. Like, let me look at the International Mouse Strain Resource. Um, so we can search for mouse strains at findmice.org. Right. So once we have, you know, located an interesting entry, uh, we can get some information about the institutions who are you know, working with that particular resource, um, any other applicable standards or restrictions, um, and of course all of these terms will give us some idea of the types of data that this source makes available. But, you know, the main point is, okay, we discovered, like, if I had just gone into um, the resource that I said, you know, I need, I'm working with mice, right? I, I need something um, that I can deposit mice, mouse related information. I can just search that and I can discover, you know, all of these um, potentially useful repositories. Um, if I've got a mutant mouse, um, I can figure out where to go with that. Um, and then you know, go to that site to find the details on it. Okay, how do I go about depositing data? Uh, this tool can, of course, also be used the other way. If you're looking for data, discovering data, it's good to know what repositories are out there making data available. So you can you can flip it that way. All right. Um, so we're basically at the conclusion of this first part of Data Publication 2. Uh, we've talked about what you might want to think of when you share your data, be fair and care. We've looked at a number of data repositories, and we've also thought about how to discover specific, even more specific data repositories with Read3 Data. And the final link I'll show you is this fairsharing.org. Um, this is a, a giant clearinghouse of information on data sharing, essentially, right? If you want to see which organizations are releasing which standards, you know, which journals have which data policies, uh, if I publish in this journal, what do I have to do? I have to make the data available where, how, um, what standards do I have to adhere to? Um, this is kind of a clearing house for all that stuff. Um, and I won't go further into it, but you know, you can go here and click around and discover these things like 
when I find a particular journal, um, it will show me um, where do I go to find the policies. Um, not all records are as detailed as others. This one is a little bit sparse, but um, you know, essentially they're trying to to create a resource that lets you discover the the practitioners, the repositories, the policies in data management. So that's fairsharing.org, and I will leave this whole topic at that point. Um, the next video in this series will turn to package creation in R as one example of how to bundle and release and share your data. So I hope this has been useful to you. Thank you for your attention and I will sign out right now.